in the house of the Lord tonight. Turn in your Bibles to uh, the book of Romans, chapter 16. You thought what, Judy? No, I finished Raven Hill. Yeah, the book. Yeah. Stand, if you will, and follow as I read the first... 16 or so verses. I commend unto you Phoebe, our sister, which is a servant of the church which is at Sancria, that ye receive her in the Lord as becometh saints, and that ye assist her in whatsoever business she hath need of you. For she hath been a success, succor, succorer of many and of myself also. Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my helpers in Christ Jesus, who have for my life laid down their own necks, and to whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. Likewise, greet the church that is in their house. Salute my well-beloved Eponidas, who is the firstfruits of Achaia unto Christ. Greet Mary, who bestowed much labor on us. Salute Andronicus and Junia, my kinsmen, and my fellow prisoners, who are of note among the apostles, who also were in Christ before me. Greet Amplius, my beloved in the Lord. Salute Urbane, our helper in Christ, and Stachus, my beloved. Salute Ap Apelles, approved in Christ. Salute them which are of Aristobulus, Aristobulus' household. Salute Herodian, my kinsman. Greet them that be of the household of Narcissus, which are in the Lord. Salute Tryphena and Tryphosa, who labor in the Lord. Salute the beloved Persis, which laboreth much in the Lord. Salute Rufus, chosen in the Lord, and his mother and mine. Salute Asyncritus, <coughs> Phlygion, Hermas, Potrobus, Hermes, and the brethren which are with them. Salute Philogolus <coughs> and Julia, Nerus and his sister, and Olympus, and all the saints which are with them. Salute one another with an holy kiss. The churches of Christ salute you. Heavenly Father, we thank you now for this opportunity again, as Pete has already prayed, to be in the house of the Lord. We do pray, Father, that as we go forth this year, it will become a, a greater house of prayer uh, through our Wednesday night services and through our desire to come before the throne of grace on a more frequent basis. Father, we thank you for your word tonight. I ask you'll be with me as I bring forth this message that uh, has been laid upon my heart for these folks. And Father, be with those who are not able to be here tonight because they're themselves on beds of sickness. We think of Pastor Welling tonight and ask you'll be with his family. Comfort them, Father, in these remaining days and give them the assurance once more that they will meet again. And we think of others, Father, that are on that are having health issues and ask your healing process with them. Now, Father, we thank you for your word. Open our hearts and mind as we share it together tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 <coughs> In some ways, it would appear perhaps to you that uh, chapter 16 of Romans is one of those least appealing chapters of the New Testament. It consists mostly of Paul's greetings to a long list of people in Rome. And uh, at first glance, at least, it would appear that it doesn't offer much in the way of interest for us today, inasmuch as the names are hard to pronounce, as you have perhaps just found out, and even harder for us to spell. And to make matters worse, uh, we don't know who most of these people are uh, because most of them are never mentioned anywhere else in the New Testament. Everybody, I think, here tonight who has ever written a letter understands what Paul is <coughs> doing here in chapter 16. He's basically finished everything that he wants to say to the Romans. But since he has a number of friends in the church, he kind of uh, scribbles off a few lines 
of greetings to as many people as he can fit onto the parchment that he may be using. The kind of thing that we do oftentimes when we write a letter to somebody. We'll write the last bit of information that we have anywhere that they'll fit. Kind of in the margins, you know, we say, tell Aunt Ruth that I love her. And uh, uh, Billy says hello. And tell <laughs> Jane that I love her dress. Uh, Frank tried to call last Friday, but nobody answered. Uh, give Neil a big hug. <clears throat> tell him to stay on that diet. Well, I got to go. Love to everybody. So if we look at things in this chapter in that light, then... Uh, this chapter offers kind of a rare view for us into early Christianity. <clears throat> Behind this list of hard-to-pronounce names uh, stands a bedrock of truth about the nature of uh, this budding Christian uh, movement and why it had the power to change the ancient world. If I were to ask you tonight what words you would use to describe the Apostle Paul, you might say things like brilliant, logical, reverent, studious, thoughtful, dedicated, driven, committed, no-nonsense, and determined. And every one of those words would indeed fit uh, this man from Tarsus. He doesn't seem to be the kind of guy that you take along with you to a football game. Uh, and you'd probably think twice before you brought him home with you to dinner. Or if you did, you'd certainly want to brush up on your theology before he appeared in your home. If he had a sense of humor, it would seem that he has it well hidden. Most of all, you certainly don't want to get into an argument with him. But Romans 16, I think, reveals kind of a different side to this so <coughs> wonderful apostle. We discover here his heart for people. Uh, he mentions in this chapter 33 people by name, including 26 people in the church uh, at Rome. And he mentions two others there, but he doesn't uh, name them. I think that's rather an amazing thing when you consider the fact that he's never been to Rome. Writing to a church he had never been to, he sends greetings to 28 different people. I think all of us know how important it is for people to remember our name. We all would like to have people remember us. Um, can you imagine how exciting it must have been for that first century church at Rome to, amongst the congregation there, for them to come to the end of Paul's letter and find that their name is listed there? Uh, quite exciting. Paul remembered them personally. Many years ago, I attended a Southwide uh, Bible conference in Jacksonville, Florida. And I was sitting there in the congregation along with Bob Carpenter and some others whose names I guess I have forgotten at this point. But I was sitting in an aisle seat and I saw a man coming up the aisle, and I said to myself, I know who that is, I think. I thought I should know the man, but I couldn't come up, to, come up with his name. And when he got to where I was sitting, he stuck out his hand and he said, Hello, David. How have you been? It turned out it was Dr. Al Janey, who was pastor of the New Testament Baptist Church that we attended in Miami for the short time that we were in Florida. Um, I often wondered what I did that caused him to remember me like that, uh, but it was certainly nice to be greeted in that way. Uh, it had been several years since uh, he had visited our home. Well, I've already mentioned that not much is known about these people that Paul greeted, but some will be familiar to you. Phoebe is mentioned in verses 1 and 2. Evidently a rich, well-to-do Christian businesswoman who carried Paul's letter from Corinth. She's called a servant. And I think you'll recognize Priscilla and Aquila from the book of Acts. They were co-workers in the tent-making business with Paul on occasion. 
They pop up in Corinth and they appear again later in Ephesus. <clears throat> Early on, they taught Apollos about Jesus in Acts 18. You'll find that. And they established house churches wherever they went. And at one point, uh, you'll find that they risked their lives for Paul. Take the time sometime, someday when you have nothing else to do, to look up some of the facts about these people. Rufus is mentioned, and that's interesting because Mark mentions that Simon of Cyrene, who carried our Lord's cross, had two sons, Alexander and Rufus. All of these characters are interesting, I think, and taken as a whole. This passage shows the breadth of the Christian message. The uh, church at Rome included the rich and the poor, the slaves and freedmen, Jews and Gentiles, Greeks and Romans, forgotten house churches and members of the imperial household. And Paul knew them all by name. How could that be, since he had never been to Rome? Evidently, he met them in his travels and remembered them in his prayers. The passage uh, before us tonight ends with a command. Salute one another with an holy kiss. This uh, holy kiss is mentioned five times in the New Testament. Peter calls it the kiss of love. In 1 Peter 5.14, we have several problems, I think, with that command today, perhaps. First and foremost, we don't take it seriously notwithstanding the fact that we say that we believe every verse in the Bible to be God's word, we don't think that the holy kiss particularly applies to us. Most of us probably put that in the category of things that they used to do back then that we don't have to do today. So the usual interpretation is that the holy kiss is not really in itself uh, very important. But the greeting of Christians fellow Christians is, is important, uh, we're told. It doesn't really matter how you do it. Back then it was a holy kiss, today it's a handshake. Same thing? Well, that seems right, until you think about it. A kiss just ain't the same as a handshake. Some of you young men remember your dating days, and uh, think back to your courting days, and you'll see the truth of that. I hope you find the truth of it today. <laughs> In the Bible, the holy kiss was a sign of love, respect, friendship, and honor. It was truly a mark of innocent affection. And we can see a lot of examples of it in Scripture. Jacob kissed his father. Laban kissed Joseph. Esau kissed Jacob. Joseph kissed his brethren. Aaron kissed Moses. <coughs> Moses kissed his father-in-law, Jethro. Naomi kissed Ruth and Orpah. David kissed Jonathan. The father kissed the prodigal son. And we could go on and on. It's interesting to trace the history of that holy kiss. Evidently, it was widely practiced in the first few centuries of the church. We're told that during the worship services, there would be a time of greeting in which the men would kiss the men and the women would kiss the women. And that's the way it ought to be. You kiss each other on the cheek or on the forehead, or in the case of the men, on the beard. Some of you guys watch out. <laughs> it was a sign of an intense family relationship in the early church. They didn't just talk about being a family. They were a family. Amen. And the holy kiss served as a symbol of their love. It was a holy kiss because it was exchanged between holy people. One document from the early church gives this instruction. Let the deacon say to the people, let no one have any quarrel against another. Let no one come in hypocrisy. Then let the men give the men and the women the women the Lord's kiss, but let no one do it with deceit, as Judas betrayed the Lord with a kiss. Augustine said of the early Christians, they demonstrated their inward peace with an outward kiss. So over time, 
the kiss became a regular part of the worship service. At some point in the early church, it was joined with the Lord's Supper. But eventually, voices were raised in warning of possible abuse. By the fourth century, it was no longer a spontaneous practice at all. A few centuries later, it disappeared from the Christian church, except as a part of the formal liturgy that some churches still hold to today. It's still practiced in the Russian Orthodox Church, for example, and a few others. So, here we are in the 21st century, and Paul says, greet one another with a holy kiss. When was the last time you received a holy kiss? When was the last time you gave one? So holding on to that radical thought briefly, <clears throat> let's ask why the holy kiss was so important in the early church. I think you'll find perhaps that the answer will lead you to have a slightly new perspective on Jesus. In the early church, <clears throat> many of uh, the gods of Greece and Rome were philosophic concepts, so-called deities that were so far removed from mankind that no one could ever get close to one. They just were remote. They were like Aristotle's unmoved mover, an abstract being in the metaphysical realm. The Gnostics thought that God could never come in contact with human flesh, he was too high, too pure, too holy. And into that world came a touchable God, a little baby. As Martin Luther said, he whom the worlds could, could not en enwrap yonder in Mary's lap. That child grew, and he walked the dusty roads of Galilee. He touches the blind and they see. He touches the lame and they walk. Parents bring their children to him and he takes them in his arms. A prostitute kisses his feet and he is honored. He becomes a touchable God to the people, not some abstract concept. The word made flesh, dwelling among men, full of grace and truth. And we are his people. The church is his body. We don't do him any justice when we say, stay away, or don't touch, I want my space. Strange as it may seem when we greet another, one another with a holy kiss or a holy hug, we're enacting the very heart of the Christian faith. We're a touchable people because we're the people of a touchable God. Why is touching so important? <clears throat> well, because oftentimes we talk and we talk and we talk and the message of the Bible doesn't come through. <clears throat> all of, most all of us can say it better sometimes with a hug. And that's the whole point of the holy kiss. <clears throat> When you hug someone or when you put a friendly arm around a shoulder or when you greet someone with a holy kiss, you're sending a message that can't be missed. That message is that I care for you. So where do we go from here? I'm not sure I want to advocate the literal practice of the holy kiss since we don't have a custom today that perfectly parallels what they did in the early church. In some situations, <clears throat> probably it's quite appropriate. In other cases, it would make someone feel quite uncomfortable. So we need sensitivity to, from the Lord to know how to best greet one another. We do need to find ways to express our holy, innocent affection for our brothers and sisters in Christ. Different people will express themselves in different ways, but we're not free to ignore this command as if it doesn't apply to us. The early Christians, who were very often hated and persecuted, loved each other fervently, and they weren't afraid to show it. <clears throat> Before I end this, let me call your attention to one of the most touching passages in the Bible. 
Acts 20 tells of Paul's final visit to the elders of the church at, at Ephesus. He's on his way to Jerusalem for the last time. And the elders go to the island of Miletus to meet him. They know, and Paul knows, that it will probably be the last time that they see each other. And in a very wonderful, marvelous final message, <clears throat> Paul lays before them a charge to be faithful to the shepherds of God's flock. And then it's time for Paul to leave. And here's how the Bible puts it. And when he had thus spoken, he kneeled down and prayed with them all. And they all wept sore and fell on Paul's neck and kissed him. These are grown men, godly men, spiritual men, leaders who are overcome with sadness, expressing their love and devotion the only way that they know how. I once had a customer <clears throat> with whom I was trying to share the gospel on the occasions that I visited with him, a man that lived up in Copenhagen. In the course of the conversation I had with him one day, uh, I told him that I loved him in Christ. And he became very, very offended. He knew nothing about Christian love. And for a man to tell another man that he loved him, Surely there, need, there, there had to be something wrong with me. In retrospect, I can understand his thinking in today's society. But Christians ought not to think that way if we're embarrassed by all of this. If we are embarrassed by talking about our love for another one of our church members or another human being, that tells us a great deal more about ourselves than it does about the Bible. <clears throat> My message ends tonight with that thought. For most of us, our greatest need is the courage to do what the Bible says, to reach out and touch a brother or a sister and simply say, I love you. We need more hugs in the body of Christ more expressions of caring, more daring to tear down the walls and get close to one another. I know I need it, and I believe you do too. <laughs> Heavenly Father, help us tonight and in the days ahead to become people who really care one for another. Father, we have people who need to be in this church who need to know that we care. Help us, Father, in every way that your Holy Spirit would direct us to show that caring attitude that we need to have, that loving attitude, as we go forth uh, into the world around us. Now, Father, as we go to our time of prayer, bring to our minds once more the needs of those who are uh, in beds of sickness, oppressed, discouraged, Whatever may be the need, Father, help us to remember them that we might take carry their need to the throne of grace tonight, to which we have such free access because of the love that you showed to us on the cross of Calvary. And we'll thank you in Jesus' wonderful and precious name. Amen. <laughs>